I'm Ronald McNeil, President and CEO for the Georgia Campaign for Adolescent Power and Potential, also known as GCAP. Welcome to the State of Adolescence, Healthier Together. Each year, we sit down with thought leaders, change makers, experts, and deep thinkers who are committed to the overall health and well-being of young people to get their valuable insight. Our guest for this year's State of Adolescence is none other than Jane Fonda, activist, Hollywood legend, and GCAP founder. Jane, it's so great to have you here today. Now today, there's a little twist to uh, the conversation. Uh, Jane will be interviewing me today, and I am humbled to have this experience with her, but we're gonna have an engaging conversation about what teens need to live a healthy lifestyle and continue on a path to a productive future. Yeah, and what GCAP is, yeah, doing to, to help Georgia's teens. And I, I wanna say that I, I'm so, I feel really happy about being back at Georgia Public Broadcasting. I haven't been here for quite a while. Um, and I'm very happy to, to be able to interview you, Ronald. Um, I, wa I wanna ask you about your job. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's challenging to lead a statewide uh, nonprofit like, like GCAP. I mean, you yeah. have to compete for funds in a very crowded space. You have to make sure that programs and services are, are aligned with the needs of youth and community, right? And yeah. make sure good staff is in place and you have to pay attention to the needs of, of the youth on the hardest topics, very personal topics of teen pregnancy prevention and sexuality education. This is all not, not very easy to do. Yeah. Certainly wasn't easy to start an organization like this in 1995. Tell me about your job and your working day. Yeah. Well, Jane, again, let me first say that it's such an honor to be able to sit down with you. Uh, I'm going to try to not be a fan at this moment. I'm a little bit in awe and shocked. Uh -oh. Shocked to be sitting here. We know here each other too well. And to have you interviewing me. Um, but it's, just, it's always great to see you. And thanks again for doing this. Um, you know, serving as CEO of GCAP is, is such a pleasure. Um, there's lots of complexities um, to running any nonprofit, but certainly a statewide nonprofit that focuses on adolescent health. Uh, we have a laser focus on a targeted population of young people, you know, ages 14, all the way and upwards of 24 years old. And as the needs of those young people are evolving, uh, we have to evolve as an organization yeah. and be flexible as it relates to uh, the services that we provide, the programs that we uh, put in place and implement and execute. And we do this from a place and a spirit of excellence and of quality and giving young people the optimal experience that they really deserve. Um, you know, everything that we do is also based on a plan. Uh, we have an outstanding, as you know, board of directors who partner with me um, in developing our current strategic plan, Impact 2025. And that is our roadmap. It gives us direction around what are the ambitious goals and objectives that we have ahead to ensure thousands of, the, thousands of young people have access to the information that they deserve um, to live a healthy lifestyle and, and to make healthy choices. Um, and then there's the business aspect of, of a nonprofit. Uh, we have to ensure that we have uh, youth professionals um, who can work with our young people, uh, professionals who are qualified, who have been uh, trained and are prepared to provide curriculums in classrooms, as well as work with community-based organizations to also meet the needs of not just uh, young people, but also the youth serving professionals that we train and also uh, the parents that we provide resources and information to. You know, we have a pretty diverse audience, uh, but the unique thing I think about GCAP's audience is not just the people that we serve, but it's the partners. It is the partners, the schools, the government agencies, the faith-based organizations, um, colleges and universities, K-12 schools. Um, there's really nothing that we do for young people 
um, without a partner connecting with us right. um, as a training and capacity building organization at GCAP. It is our job to ensure that parents and these youth serving professionals um, have they are they have medically accurate information that they are sharing with young people in all types of settings. So um, while there are complexities, I get up to do this work every single day. Um, for me personally, it's not just uh, a job, but it's it really feels like I'm something I'm purposed to do. It feels like a calling. Yeah. So um, I am committed to serving youth and families in this state every single day. Yeah. Oh, I'm so grateful to you, Ron. <laughs> you know, you, you, you talked about GCAP's evolution. I, I think it's the sign of a healthy organization to evolve. Yeah. Because the context, you know, the, the social and political landscape changes, yeah. right? I mean, when I, when I started GCAP in 1995, um, well, I started to lay the groundwork in 94. It was so hard. I mean, there were so many counties that didn't want to see us. They didn't want anything to do with us. Yeah. Um, now that those are the same counties that are asking us, yeah. pleading with us to come in. I, I, feel, I feel so proud of, of our growth and evolution over the many years since we started, and I'm so grateful to you. Um, yeah. You're working on your... Doctorate. Tell me what what you're 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 doing. A yeah, I, I'm in a doctorate for business administration yeah. at uh, Georgia State University. How yeah. how do you do that on top of your job? Um, I don't know. Some days, <laughs> to <laughs> right. be honest, um, but uh, it's all about balance um, and prioritizing uh, the opportunity to have an organization that is supporting me uh, in pursuing and continuing my education to grow as a professional, to grow as a business leader. Um, I'm very grateful to GCAP and the board uh, for giving me this opportunity and supporting me in that way. Um, I'm committed to lifelong learning. Um, and uh, this doctorate, uh, the DBA that I'm pursuing is really about just ensuring that I stay on the cutting edge of business strategy, of approaches and, and ways in which um, to ensure that GCAP is a strong organization that we can sustain. You know, this organization has been around for 27 years. Uh, we'll celebrate our 30th anniversary in just a couple of years. I want this organization to be around for 30 more years. You're here. Um, and in order to do that, we have to have strong business strategies. And so that's what the program at Georgia State University has given me those opportunities um, to grow as a business leader in the, in the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. As a dad of a teenager and a <laughs> Gen Z, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it keeps you on your toes. Um, as the CEO of an organization that connects with young people and parents, I'm sure that you've learned a lot. Um, so I, I want to know as GCAP, we have now the GCAP Parent Toolkit. Yes. Yay. One of my favorite resources. Uh, it's an amazing product. And what kind of feedback do you, do you get from parents? You see, we, we want parents to be what's known as askable parents. You yeah. know, there's all kinds of teaching opportunities that parents have, but it's really, really hard to talk to adolescents for all kinds of reasons. And so we, we want to help them know how to do that. Tell me what you've learned from parents. Yeah, so the Parent Toolkit uh, was launched in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and we started the Parent Toolkit, as you mentioned, um, to help young, pe uh, help young people uh, but also to provide parents with information where they can have open dialogue, open communication about topics specifically at the time around teen pregnancy prevention mm -hmm. um, and sexual health. Um, but as, again, the needs of, of young people have evolved, um, there were so many topics that young people began to bring to us uh, and parents um, bringing to us saying, you know, what about mental health? What about bullying? What about social injustice? Um, the impact of the pandemic um, during um, those years. The impact of climate change. Yes, yes. So many different topics um, came from parents around, we need to know what to say, how to approach these conversations, and give young people a platform mm -hmm. to not only for us to listen, but also for young people to know that their voice can be heard.
heard. Mm -hmm. um, that they can be powerful change agents and we can, as parents, can guide them and support them um, through that. And so the Parent Toolkit, it's on our website. Uh, it is an absolutely free resource to um, not only parents, but trusted adults who just want to be armed with information, um, armed with the right information um, as they are helping young people navigate the adolescent years and you know, discussing some very, what can be considered prickly topics. Yeah, um, it's helping parents be ask askable parents. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, giving parents the, the motivation and the mm -hmm. courage um, to, to have these conversations in an open manner and in a non-judgmental uh, way. Um, I'm practicing that every day still with two daughters, even in the, right. even in sitting in this chair, a leading organization who understands how to do this. But as a parent, you know, I want my daughters to uh, know that they can come to me, that they can talk to me, that I will listen to them, but I also can share advice and information in a way that they can receive. Um, and in some cases, um, you know, we can also learn together. Um, I think there's so many things that's happened in the world that um, that even I haven't experienced that my young, my kids are also experiencing for the first time as well. And so we can approach the situation and approach these conversations in a way that says, you know, we're gonna walk through this together. Yeah. And the Parent Toolkit certainly helps parents do yeah. that. Yeah, you wanna give the audience our website? Yeah, uh, yes, www.gcapp.org. Dot org. That's www.gcap.org. Thank you. And you know, one of the things that makes me so proud and happy about the work that you've brought to GCAP is that you're, you're, you're ha you have such robust programs now for boys. Yeah. For so long, after I founded GCAP and before I left Georgia, I worked so hard to try to figure out how do we include the boys. You know, everybody hears about GCAP and um, you know, even my friends sometimes assume that we just work with girls. Yeah, yeah. Takes two, folks. Uh, not only that, but, you know, when you're an adolescent, whether you're a boy or a girl, it's, there's, they have to know how to relate to each other in a healthy way, and they have yeah. to know, you know, like, the, mo the question that I would get the most was, from girls. How do I know if it's a real relationship? You know, things like that are really on their minds. So I'm just, I'm so glad that you're working with boys. Um, there's been a lot of expansion. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that sure. with the boys programs? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, for the past few years, we've been working in Clayton County, um, as well as Macon Bibb County through a project entitled Project Eben. Uh, the word Eben is a West African uh, term uh, that means to uh, build a fence and to protect. And what we recognize is that um, young, young boys, young males, um, particularly uh, black males uh, is, is the uh, population that this program targeted, uh, deserves um, space to be protected, to feel safe, um, and to have opportunities to connect with caring adults through mentorship. Um, in a way that's culturally responsive and in a way that also provides them with information um, about their sexual health, about the choices that they deserve to make around how to build and how to be a part of a healthy uh, relationship, um, to how to dismiss um, some of the misconceptions when it comes to uh, a male's role mm -hmm. in a relationship. You know, you and I have talked a lot about you know, this idea of toxic masculinity. And it's important that in order to help um, young men uh, overcome that is to empower them. You know, I heard Oprah mention um, in an interview recently, Jane, particularly talking about um, black males. She, and the question that she asked was, how do we empower black males in a society and in a world that refuses to acknowledge their humanity? And so we want to ensure through Project Ed Ed Eben um, that young black males understand um, that they deserve to be respected, they deserve to be heard, they deserve to be treated fairly, um, and they deserve support. 
And through this program and through the volunteers and our partnership with Community Health Solutions, led by Javon Gibson and the team over there at CHS, uh, we're doing that work. What is CHS? Community Health Solutions. Uh, it's a organization and consulting firm that's partnering with, with us um, to uh, work with communities through community engagement, uh, to support mar mar marginalized uh, populations in those communities, in this case, um, African-American males, and to support them and to teach the community how to support them and give them the path and, and direction that they need to oh, live a healthy lifestyle. That's so great. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was so stunned when I lived in Georgia and I would spend time with, with boys, black and white, the extent to which they truly believed that their, that their manhood, the proof that they were men, yeah. depended on how many girls they'd knocked up already. You know, yeah, and the willingness of girls to be side girls, you mm -hmm. know, knowing they weren't the main girlfriend, but that they were they were the extra girlfriends yeah. was just broke my heart. And I'm glad we're, we're addressing that. Yeah. And um, Jane, let me just say, you know, so much of that um, comes from um, the pressures that males often feel societal, societal pressures. Societal yeah. pressures. Absolutely. Um, they feel like that's the role they're supposed to play. Right. That's the thing they're supposed to do even when in some cases that not, that's not even something that they're even thinking about. But I think society um, impresses that idea and that concept upon them. Right. Um, and so hopefully through this program, through Project Evan, we can course correct some of yeah, that yeah. with the thousands of young people that we hope to serve over the next so five great. years. Give me five. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yeah. So I founded GCAP in 1995. At that time, Georgia had the highest the highest rate of teen pregnancy in the entire United States. Yeah. That's why I founded GCAP, yeah. which focused exclusively on teen pregnancy prevention at that time. We've now branched out. Um, and by the way, we do not deal with abortions, <laughs> right? right? It's not part of our thing. We make abortion unnecessary. That's it's what about we prevention. try to do. That's right. Teen pregnancy rates in Georgia have dropped 75% since yeah. then. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'd like, but I can't pretend that it's all because of GCAP. The presence of AIDS made a big difference because kids decided that they had to start wearing protection, condoms or various kinds of, of, of protections. Um, but GCAP had a lot to do with it. We are still the only go-to organization in Georgia totally focused on adolescence. Yeah. Um, but the big drop happened a lot because of the partners that we have. We believe in partners from the beginning. We believed in partnerships. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned it a little bit in your opening remarks, but talk a little more about our partnerships. Sure. Um, so our largest partner um, is through schools, partnerships uh, with particularly middle schools and high schools. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to train teachers um, and other educators within the school system um, on evidence-based, medically accurate curriculums focused on comprehensive sex education, mm -hmm. um, ensuring that young people have access to comprehensive sex ed in a way that um, ensures that they have the right information to know how to make informed choices mm -hmm. um, if they decide to engage in sexual activity. Um, it is not always easy um, to um, partner uh, or to have the opportunity to partner with school districts. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions even today with all that we know about the importance of a comprehensive approach as everything that we know about the power of contraceptions. Uh, there's still a lot of misconceptions out there about sex ed. Um, and what we try to do is to go in and uh, dismiss those uh, misconceptions. Uh, we sit down with school, school board leaders, we sit down with principals, superintendents, and we walk them through um, the curriculums that GCAP have access to. 
Um, but we also give them an opportunity to customize curriculums in a way that really speaks to the needs of the young people in their community. Um, so much of our work, Jane, as you know, is county by county, community by community. Because everyone has a different culture, a different population. Absolutely, absolutely. And so we want to be able to address those needs head on. And so when we sit down with school leaders, we talk to them about, you know, what are the things that you want young people to have access to? We even bring parents to the table so that they can have a voice and provide feedback and insight in the process. It's really um, a way to ensure um, inclusivity in the yeah. process um, so that everyone has a buy-in, so that everyone's on board and supports the efforts ahead yeah. for te teachers to provide sex ed. Mm -hmm. We also host community conversations um, county by county. Um, and during these community conversations, uh, we really talk about, you know, what are the current and emerging issues that young people are facing? And through those conversations, we learn um, so much um, from community leaders and community stakeholders about the needs from young people. And they are wide and verse in nature. Um, but it's important to us as an organization to not only help um, community leaders understand what the disparities are, what the gaps are, mm -hmm. um, but also recognize what their value proposition is mm -hmm. as a community and what they can do now, what they can do midterm, and what they can do um, from a long-term standpoint to ensure that they can take action mm -hmm. and do the things that need to be done mm -hmm. to support young people on their path uh, to adulthood yeah. as it relates to their health choices. Right, now do we have any proof that the teachings that end up happening have an effect on the kids' relation, uh, um, behaviors? Absolutely, we do. Tell um, me about you know, that. our program uh, working um, to institutionalize sex education or the WISE program, um, our research and our outcomes show that those school districts who have young people that are participating in the WISE program. Uh, they have uh, better behaviors as it relates to how they navigate and go about making um, sexual health choices. I mean, also demonstrate their health outcomes are better as it relates to teen births or um, exposure or incidence of STIs. Um, sexually transmitted infections. Absolutely, absolutely. And so the data is clear. Uh, when young people have access to a comprehensive approach as it relates to sex ed, um, they have better health outcomes. And that's really the goal and a yeah. big part of our mission yeah. is to continue to reduce, our, not only re reduce, but I think when GCAP started, I think the mission at the time was to eliminate, to eliminate the teen births. Uh, in Georgia. And so we're still working toward that, yeah. um, not only in the area of teen pregnancy prevention, but we also want to reduce and eliminate uh, sexually transmitted infections. And um, secondary uh, pregnancies. And secondary yeah. pregnancies, repeat pregnancies are a big challenge right. for many communities across the state. Yeah. Um, and it's important that community leaders um, not turn a blind eye to these issues. Yeah to understand that um, some of these situations and these issues are not going anywhere if we don't take action. And the way that we can take action is through education and yeah. through prevention. Yeah. You know, I remember back in the mid nineties uh, or longer than that when I lived in Georgia and was more hands-on with GCAP, yeah. that you know what, what I would get from counties that didn't want our comprehensive sexuality education, they believed that comprehensive sexuality education would encourage kids to have sex, give them yeah. permission to have sex. Yeah. And we know that that's not true. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's like saying, if you wear a helmet when you're riding a motorcycle, it's gonna encourage accidents. Sure, sure, you know, it's about- Is that still though a concern? No, you know, I, I think we hear less of that. Less of that. Um, I, I think, um, you know, we are, I would like to think we're a more informed society, right? And one of the things that yeah. we do to be informed as a society is to allow data and information and the facts um, speak to us. And I think there's been, you know, decades of research that demonstrate the fact that comprehensive sex education works um, and it does improve health outcomes for young people. Um, and in those cases where um, we have to kind of talk through and work through some of the misconceptions, some of the information out there that is not correct, that's mm -hmm. not medically ac accurate, that's not factual, um, you know, we have trained professionals who can speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, and But also do it in a way that I think meets uh, people where they are. 
and help kind of move them to the point of understanding. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a lack of awareness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I often regret that I don't still live in Georgia and, and get a chance to talk directly to the young people. But what, what are you hearing? What, what is top of mind for uh, teenagers in Georgia? Yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges that young people are facing. Um, you know, because uh, we live in a world where information and um, data and opinions are at their fingertips. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that young people have to sift through as it relates to, you know, how they take in that information, how that information impacts their Is it decisions. disinformation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, we hear from young people, number one, that they want accurate information. They want to know um, what the medically accurate information is so that they know, OK, um, these are the things I need to know to make decisions yeah, as it relates to my Are they more... Health. Do you, do you feel that there's more depression? Mental health is absolutely yeah. um, a challenge. Um, Post-COVID, you know, one of the things and one of the, the, the challenges that seem to be emerging more and more every day is this idea of social isolation. Yeah. Even though young people can post, um, you know, something on social media and get hundreds and thousands of responses, um, from their social media followers and the social media uh, world, they still feel alone. Um, I think uh, personally and professionally, a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, as humans, we still need that personal interaction. Um, and many young people are still feeling and experiencing that isolation of feeling alone, feeling like their voice doesn't matter, feeling like what they believe and what they think um, is not important to others. And so as an organization, GCAP has become more intentional about integrating uh, and engaging young people's voice, um, not just from the standpoint of us educating them, but also to allow them to inform our work, to inform our programs, to create opportunities for innovation in the strategies that we implement to support them on their path to a healthy lifestyle. Uh, one of our most powerful, I think, youth engagement and youth empowerment programs is our Youth Advisory Council. We have a group of uh, over 70 young people who are from communities across the entire state who um, receive training from us um, as it relates to adolescent health and leadership, um, but they also inform our work and we give them a platform um, to share what their thoughts and what their ideas are and also give them tools and resources to be advocates and change agents in their local community among their peers, um, as well as with the adults that make decisions about their life. We give them the tools to say, here's the way that you can ensure that your voice can be heard. Here's the way that you can create change. And young people need that. They deserve that. It gives them that sense of agency. It gives them that sense of belonging. It gives them uh, a sense of purpose. Um, and we want them to have that now as teenagers and yeah. certainly carry that into their adulthood. Yeah. You know, I, I used to say, and, and I still do believe, that hope yeah. is the best contraceptive. Yes. You know, it's why most teen pregnancies happen in low-income communities, poor communities. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's because when you're privileged, when you have resources, you know there's going to be a future. You yeah. know, I have an adopted daughter that grew up... Um, very, very poor in Oakland. And I had a children's camp and when I, before, this is pre Ted Turner, this is pre my moving to Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a children's camp where there were very wealthy kids, you know, Angelina Jolie went to it. And then there was a kid that came with a parole officer. There were kids that didn't speak English. It was all over the place in terms of diversity and socioeconomic sure. uh, levels. And I asked her, what, why did the camp mean so much to you? And she, it took her about five seconds to say, I met people who thought about the future. Wow. Uh, it was jaw dropping for yeah. me because I didn't, I never thought about the fact that, I mean, everybody I know thinks about the future. What am I going to be when I grow up and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But very, extremely poor kids, it's Friday night. It's not the future. Yeah. And consequently, so I have a kid. They don't think about the impact it's going to have on their future. They're, 
the difficulties that it will take for them to take advantage of opportunities that come mm -hmm. along and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Now we have the climate crisis, which is threatening the future. And I worry because, you know, there's a thing now, it's called eco-anxiety and all over the country, all mm -hmm. over the world, we, we hear psychotherapists saying that they see a huge uptick in, in depression and eco-anxiety because kids really worry that there is no future. Yeah. And I just wonder, is that going to, is that going to start impacting the level there? Is that going to make them feel, well, then why not? engage in risky sexual behavior. I worry about it. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I, I think the young people that GCAP have an opportunity to serve, um, you know, I see many of them very hopeful. I see many of them with um, being very optimistic about their future. And it is because they have support from organizations like GCAP and community-based organizations and schools um, and other adults. Well, then we got to get much bigger very fast. Yes, all we I can do. Say. Yes, if we do. If we're keeping kids hopeful, that's, you know, it's not optimism. Optimism is everything's going to be fine, yeah. but you yeah. don't do anything to make it so. Yeah. Hope is a muscle. You know, yeah. you take action to make something better, and then you start to find hope. And that's what we do through the Youth Advisory Council, right? We yeah. give young people um, the tools and resources they need to take action. Yeah. Um, and that sense of hope um, that I think that they feel um, is because um, they have a way to engage. Yeah. They have a way to be a part of the work ahead, to not only solidify their own future, but for the futures of um, the little ones that are coming even yeah. behind them, their That's younger so right. siblings, you know, the other younger kids um, in elementary school that even they interact with every single day. You know, I will say that, you know, I, I do think young people do find themselves often in this place of um, survival mode. While they're hopeful, there is a sense of like, I have, how do I get through today? Yeah. How do I get through tomorrow? How do I, you know, deal with all the pressures of, you know, everything that is coming at me as a teenager and everyone saying to me, these are things you have to do to be prepared, to be ready for adulthood, how to be productive, do well in school, how to be a caring citizen, even at a young age. Um, I see this in my own, um, you know, daughters. Um, and uh, what I've learned is that I, is that as a parent and as a caring adult, we have to listen to young people. We have to listen to not only their successes, but also their challenges, their fears. Um, and just sometimes by giving them that space to share and to have that open dialogue and to be transparent, that sometimes creates that sense of hope, that sense of release that they need to know everything's gonna be okay. And I have people around me who support me right. and want me uh, to, to do well and to live a great life ahead. Yeah. Well, GCAP has absolutely had so many successes. So I want to know what your vision of the future is for GCAP. Yeah, um, simple answer to that. Um, first and foremost, comprehensive sex, sex ed for every single young person in this state. Across the board. In, Across in, the board. In, yeah. um, that is going to take systemic change. That is going to take policy change. And we're doing the work um, at the Capitol, at the Gold Dome. Um, right in downtown Atlanta, talking to legislators, talking to leaders within the governor's office, um, talking to decision makers about the importance of comprehensive sex ed mm -hmm. and why um, it's necessary, why it's needed, and how it really can um, demonstrate improved outcomes for, for young people. And it would save millions of dollars for the state, wouldn't it? S save millions of dollars, but I, I think most importantly, um, say thousands of lives, yeah. millions of lives. I said dollars because the state cares a lot about that. Absolutely, part of the team. absolutely. I just wanted to get absolutely. that out there. Yeah. yeah, you know, return on investment um, is, is very much important. Right. Um, for the state. And and what I what I believe um, in the conversations that I have with legislators is that they understand, mm -hmm. um, they get it. Many of them are parents, their grandparents their aunts and uncles, they're having these conversations with the young people in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. um, and they understand that young people need access to more information. Mm -hmm. um, they need- So what's holding it up? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think um, we need to grow. We need to expand so that there's more of our leadership and more of our supporters out there um, sharing this information, advocating for the policy change. Well, I will have to say, Ronald, that the GCAP that has come into being in 2023 is beyond my wildest imagination back in 95 when I started it. Yeah. I congratulate you. Yeah, um, I appreciate that coming from you. Um, you know, I appreciate the fact that you seeing a need and being responsive to that need has created a movement um, by way of this organization. Um, yeah. Your leadership is is just invaluable. Well, see, you know, I've always been white, I've always been privileged, and yet my adolescence was awful. Yeah. My mother had died I was when I was 12, and my dad was away all the time. And so my movement into everything from getting my period to dating, the whole thing, I was, it was all, oh, I was on my own. Yeah. I didn't know who to go to to answer my questions. You know, I'll be perfectly honest, this is kind of personal, but when I was 14, it was around that time, was when the first trans woman mm. happened. And I'm, I'm, I'm old now, and I forgot what her name is, but she was very, very famous. Jorgensen, Christine Jorgensen. Everybody here is too young to even know. But it was a big deal. She was on the cover of every paper and every magazine, and I read about this with some degree of obsession, I might add, mm. because it said she had been a boy and she became a, a woman. And I thought that I was, I mean, I, I didn't know, I, I, I didn't know mm -hmm. what was going on down there. I thought maybe that an, anatomically I was supposed to be a boy and it traumatized me and I had wow. nobody to ask. Anyway, all those kind of things, made me uh, want to do something that would help other young people um, not have to go through that kind of uncertainty and not have those kind of questions that they didn't know how to, how to get answers. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that so, is... So I'm really grateful for GCAP, and I thank you so much. Yeah, that's the goal of this organization every single day, is to ensure that young people don't find themselves in that position of feeling alone, of feeling like they don't have anyone to talk to, yeah. anyone they can go to. They don't yeah. know where to find the information. They don't know um, where to find their resources. They don't know how to, how to access their... their questions answered. They have their questions yeah. answered, how to you know have access to health care. Yeah. where they can talk to doctors right. and physicians um, about um, how to make health choices from a medically accurate standpoint. Um, you know, Jane, you know, what you did those many years ago um, has not only supported girls and boys, but we've even expanded our programs to serving LGBTQ plus youth um, as well through um, innovative strategies, county by county, to ensure that those young people feel supported uh, as well. And have... It's more important than it ever has been in the history of humankind. Absolutely. Life for everybody has become more challenging, but Absolutely. you know, people don't understand for a long time, people never understood the importance of that block of time that's called adolescence. Yeah. You know, they just kind of, it was either part of adulthood or part of being a child. But no, we know now that, that psychologically, sociologically, this is a unique period of human development. Mm -hmm. That's really, it's the gateway to adulthood. And what happens to a young person during that time is going to have such tremendous impact on what they become as as an adult later yeah and there's far too much trauma there's far too much sexual violence there's far too much incest mm -hmm. that is not talked about yeah but it's epidemic absolutely and all of these things change a child's life and it's during that period called adolescence that they can be cured and helped over the, hur the hurdles. And so I, again, Ronald, thank you so much for letting me interview you and for what you're doing with this organization. 
in a state that needed GCAP so badly. Yeah. And I guess still does. And onward. Onward, yeah. The, the organization continues to grow. We have an ambitious plan. Um, our current strategic plan, Impact 2025, calls for us to reach 525,000 Georgians across the state. That is young people, parents, and youth serving professionals. And we are unapologetic in this work ahead to ensure all young people across the state um, have the opportunity to make healthy choices. Yeah. You know, that period of adolescence that you talked about, what I have found in you know my 20 plus years of doing this work in youth development and serving parents, when it comes to young people, particularly when it comes to teenagers, so much of what's happening to them, um, for them, around them, uh, through them is really based on choices mm -hmm. and decisions. Teenagers are positioned every single day to make a choice, to make a decision, and even one that could shift and change their trajectory of their lives in an amazing way or the most detrimental way. Right. And so what we want to ensure that young people have the support, they have the resources, they have the information mm -hmm. that they need, um, they have the motivation and empowerment that they need to make those choices yeah. in a healthy manner. Right. You know, one more thing that I want to add, because I've discovered that people don't quite understand this about GCAP. You know, there are other organizations that work with young people that you can volunteer for. Yeah. You know, because it doesn't require very much training and, you know. But G GCAP is really, I guess it's called an intermediary organization. We hire professional people absolutely who work with either as therapists or as teachers as whatever yeah. with the young people we don't have volunteers doing it and i think that's quite different than other absolutely we are a training and capacity building that's organization right. yeah. and so what that means technical that we're, assistance we're training adults we're providing technical assistance to professionals who work with young people every day um, to ensure that they are properly trained and giving the information needed um, to provide curriculums and and programs in the classroom as well as during out of school time. Yeah. Um, and we also um, build the capacity of communities um, to be responsive to not only current, but also emerging needs of adolescent health. Yeah. So um, there's so much more ahead for GCAP. Right. And again, Jay, I'm so excited and so grateful that you uh, agreed to, to be have this discussion with me and, and to interview me. This, this has been yeah, it's been fun. And thank you to Georgia Public Broadcasting for having us onto your space. So joining me now uh, is a group of partners and uh, supporters and uh, one of our Youth Advisory Council members um, is here to continue the discussion about the state of adolescence and we'll be specifically talking about uh, sex education, and particularly sex ed in schools. Um, I have Micaiah Spotwood. Um, she's an 11th grader at North Cobb High School and a member of our GCAP Youth Advisory Council. Um, Dr. Aisha Redman, uh, an OBGYN with Kaiser and a GCAP board member. Uh, and Dan Smith. Uh, Dan is K through 12 Fine Arts, Health, MPE Curriculum Coordinator at uh, Clark County School District. Thank you all so much for being here and being part of the State of Adolescence. Happy to be here. Well, we've got a lot to cover, um, a lot of questions to ask, needs your insight and feedback and expertise and thoughts uh, around this topic of comprehensive sex education. Um, so we're going to jump right into it. And uh, Dan, I would love to start with you. Um, so, uh, you know, the first question is, um, Implementing comprehensive sex ed, um, obviously Clark County has been focused on this topic um, of education for quite some time uh, in partnership with GCAP. And um, please share with me, how does comprehensive sex ed look um, for Clark County schools? And why was it important to implement comprehensive sex ed for the school district? Sure, so for our school district, you know, consistent with our state and local policies. Uh, that means working with the Committee of Parents, Health Professionals, 
uh, community members, students, and groups like GCAP to review curriculum to find the best material to cover topics for, for our community. Uh, for us, that includes age-appropriate, medically accurate information on growth and human development, communication skills, consent is something that we really stress along with that, uh, sexual behavior and health, disease prevention, gender roles and diversity, sexual abuse and human trafficking awareness and prevention. As to the importance, we're really working to empower our students to make smart choices in their life um, when it comes to their sexual health while they're treating others with respect. Our goal is to provide the information and skills for healthy relationships for their, for their life. That's great. And, you know, how do you think um, the students and parents, how are they receiving um, having comprehensive sex ed as a part of the curriculum, um, as a part of the education and learning experience there in Clark County? It, it's, it's well received. Um, we've got it set up across the curriculum. So, you know, age appropriate wise, things kind of get phased in throughout their, their career from elementary on up. Yeah. Um, it, it's a, it's a subject that when things get into the community, people have a lot of opinions. There's no shortage of opinions. Sure. So there is a lot of, um, opportunity for parents to preview curriculum, to even opt their students out if they prefer not to uh, to go through that with us in the school system. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm sure it's a lot, you know, navigating some of the nuances of student opinion and perspective and parents. And um, I'm sure, you know, GCAP, and I hope that GCAP is there to help um, the school leaders navigate that process. Yeah, GCAP has been so, so helpful for, uh, for us as we, you know, things, from one year to the other change you know yeah. we we had the the pandemic roll through and we had to make adjustments there um there's little new bits of uh legislation that pops up and then we need support on you know tweaking our curriculum to meet those needs as well so you've been an excellent partner for us and you have been one for us as well we oh, love you. working with clark county school district so makai i want to turn to you our youth advisory council part of our youth empowerment focus area and honestly one of my favorite programs um, at GCAP because it's where youth voice is, is very important in youth engagement. Um, so I, I know one of the areas that youth advisory council members really focus on is educating your peers um, about adolescent sexual health. Can you tell me what drew you to become a youth advisory council member and why was it important for you to be a part of, of this work? Sure. So I started off with another organization called Sister Love Inc., which focuses on black women and children living with HIV. Mm. And I heard about GCAP through that. And I guess what really drew me to GCAP was the youth representation and um, reach for us as children to actually do something. And I think that like adolescents respond better to their peers telling them. And when it's valid information and it's actually true. It's definitely better than just getting random information offline or being scared because of the curriculum we learn in schools. Yeah, you know, Jane and I talked about that earlier. And, you know, she asked me the question around, you know, what do young people have to say about uh, what's important to them? You know, what things do they want uh, from these types of experience? And you just validated um, the very thing I shared that, you know, you all have so much information coming to you from all different places, from your parents, from your peers, from social media, from your teachers. And you are having to sift through all of that to say, you know, what's the right information and what's the right information for me as I'm making health choices. So uh, being a part of the Youth Advisory Council sounds like it's helping you navigate those all that information. Yes. Absolutely. That's great. So, Dr. Redman, uh, welcome. Yep. Thank you for being a part of the GCAP Board of Directors. Um, and we are so grateful for Kaiser's support for many, many years, supporting our comprehensive sex education work um, in specific counties throughout Metro Atlanta. Um, outside of schools, um, you know, frank discussions with parents. Uh, what do you see as the family physician's role in sex ed and helping parents 
navigate those conversations and what can you tell me specifically from your experiences happening in that space? Yeah, so talking to your kids about sex is very hard um, and you need some allies like GCAP, um, but also your family physician, your pediatrician. Um, the, the discussion should start probably when they're about 12, 13, like mm -hmm. younger than you would think. You you look at this and you're like, my baby, right? Oh, I like, they're not going to be having sex. Like, no, they're just my baby. But the information needs to start early. Um, so talking with their pediatrician, talking to them about how their bodies are changing. Mm -hmm. um, we talk to them about vaccines that would help them uh, prevent, um, um, fight off exposures, sexually transmitted exposures at that young age. And even though we may not be going deep into um, um, intimacy and uh, you still need to have the discussion and use your family physician to talk about these are the changes that are happening in your body. This is normal. This is not normal. Your mom is your ally. Your dad is your ally. I'm your ally. Just mm -hmm. opening those doors yeah. so that the children are comfortable coming to some one of those uh, uh, people to 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 ask more questions. So, Makaya, to that point, I want to ask you a question, um, and maybe you can let us in a little bit, um, kind of behind the scenes of what your peers are talking about or thinking about. What comes up? as it relates to sexual health? What topics and, and what types of things are being discussed related to this particular topic? Um, a lot of pregnancy scares and mm -hmm. um, scares of where to go, like when those things happen. Um, so a lot of my peers don't know that you can get tested at the age of, I think it's 14 without parental consent in some places. So Sister Love offers that. Um, and so just letting them know that there's places they can go and people that they can talk to um, the, another thing that comes up often is like, what if they've contracted something because they don't know if it's mm -hmm. just maybe their pH being off or them actually having something. And so just letting them know that there's people and places that they can go to and, um, letting them know that it's going to be okay. Even if they don't have that at home support system, there's still people there that will support them. You know, obviously, you know, adolescence is a, uh, very, you know, complex developmental stage, um, particularly when it comes to your, you know, the body, mm -hmm. um, you know, how does, how do young people like yourself, you know, do you feel like you have enough information when it comes to anatomy, when it comes to your bodies, how to care for it, how to protect yourself? Do you feel like you have access to enough information? So for me, my parents have always done a very good job of educating me. Um, sadly, in my county, they're now restricting books. Um, so mm. in school, it's definitely limited. But I think that with um, just like having educated peers and people to tell you about those resources or places where you can learn accurate information about your body and things of that nature, that um, more people are educated um, in that sense than they would be just with school, like the education they receive from school. Mm. So then, you know, as we know in this work, sometimes the, you know, the topic of sex ed can be so polarizing and, and oftentimes controversial. Um, do you think sex ed is just as polarizing, volatile and controversial now, uh, maybe the, as it was, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago? Or do you think we've made progress in that regard? I think it probably always will be because we've we've stigmatized it so much to be a subject that we kind of don't really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So the more open conversations we have, I think will lead to the destigmatization de of that. Um, and then um, to your point is is setting kids up so that they they know where to go for accurate information and um, as a parent, I always look for those teachable moments and, and found ways to help my kids decode media. Mm. And um, I think the more we talk about it, it'll just, it'll just become natural that this is just a part of our lives. Um, you know, we hear about the culture wars all the time and there's times where if you get a chance, you just have to advocate for it and you have to stand up and you, when you get a chance, just, stand up and speak up, so. Absolutely, so open communication is, is definitely key, not only with 
young people directly, but also, you know, within communities and um, among adults. I think it's important that we become comfortable with talking about sex education with one another mm -hmm. and uh, kind of helping close some of those information gaps, sharing information, sharing knowledge, sharing lived experiences that maybe we're having as parents and trusted adults about how to go about having those open communication um, with our young people in our lives about sex ed. Um, it's why the Parent Toolkit exists, you know, with GCAP. That's really how the Parent Toolkit was birthed. We were hearing from parents saying, we need more resources. We want to have these conversations with our kids in our lives, but we need more resources and access to the information to help us do just that. So Dr. Redman, um, our work was um, has taught us that conference sex education and teen pregnancy prevention are critical to improving the social and emotional and physical and mental health of young people. Can you share a little bit about why adolescent sexual health is so important to overall health? Right. So what, um, like I was saying, right? So a young lady, young guy, you know, let's say they have a, a scare, like her period is late, right? So she's worried. She doesn't know where to go. Is she paying attention in school? Is she engaging with her friends? Is she um, um, able to retain the information as she's studying and performing well on tests? No, she, her, she's present, but she's not really present. She's absent. She's, this has kind of consumed her. Um, she's worried about, will I be able to go to college? And so all these answers she doesn't have while she's waiting to know, you know, does she have a pregnancy scare? So it's so important to um, educate on how to prevent these situations, right? contraception or abstinence or barrier methods, have the conversation and make it available and accessible so that that young lady or young guy isn't um, sidetracked from the worry or the concern um, as they're waiting to find out. And hopefully it's all, all good and all negative, but mm -hmm. still um, they should be more worried about kind of like, you know, like who's going to win Friday's football game, right? Not, right. not you know, oh my gosh, like my parents are going to kill me. Um, I'm not going to be able to go to college. How am I going to support a child? Yeah. So this is a question for, for everyone and, and feel free to respond. Um, how do you see communities making sure adolescents get the knowledge and information they need uh, when it comes to sex ed, when it comes to protecting themselves, how to prevent sexual violence um, and, and how to, you know, recognize the signs if they feel un, unsafe or they feel like they're in an unsafe relationship um, or situation. Um, you know, how do we help communities understand um, how to address this, how to talk about it, how to kind of come together to ensure that sex ed is, is prevalent uh, within the community? Um, I'll start with, I know personally in my community, um, First of all, my parents started with just being honest um, about their experiences. Both my mom and dad were teenagers at one point, and they had sex and their parents. And so just being honest with what they went through and kind of explaining what they wish they knew mm -hmm. and then using that and giving me proper knowledge and education for me to there, then take to my peers. Um, and a lot of that, it sometimes it is rooted in shame where you don't want to tell your kids about what you've been through, but your kid will go through the same thing and you won't have an idea because then your kid carries that same shame. So I think honesty and transparency um, from those who are educated um, will kind of make people that are learning about sex or getting ready to try or experiment feel more comfortable and just knowing that everybody has to start somewhere and knowledge is better um, as a president. Yeah. Other thoughts about how the community can be responsive? We really work to connect the students with local resources. Uh, we've got a lot of health organizations, um, both locally and nationally, that we are very adamant to share that information so that students know where to go to find proper information because, you know, TikTok doesn't always have the best, uh, best information, but it's really accessible, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So also teaching them how to navigate through to find, you know, what's what's fact, what's fiction, how do I know to look at this type of media to make sure that this is probably good information. Mm -hmm. um, 
but definitely having those local healthcare professionals as well to be able to work with is is a is a great great plus. So I, I love the way you all are kind of talking about the different audiences. You know, parents, healthcare professionals, school leaders. Um, Dr. Redmond, I think you were going to add something as well about mm -hmm. the community. All right. So if you in the community, if you are an organization or a business that um, has anything to do with adolescents, right? I, we. It is all of our responsibilities to provide information around sex education. You don't care if you're selling ice cream, um, ha have a, a signage um, because uh, GCAP information, you could use those resources. But just remember, you know, this is not a stigma. We are all here because we, our, our, our parents were intimate, they had sex. Um, our children, we hope, will um, be responsible but we can't control that. So let's arm them with information, whether it is through their physician or whether it's through the after school, you know, basketball league, have um, information readily available for them. It could be something small like a QR code to GCAP. It could be something big like a, a, a an event that you hold, um, just a, a, a panel discussion talking about sex. It could be anything, but don't, um, um, be, have your head in the sand. Um, really understand that these kids, um, they want the information. They are, they, they're going to do activities. We need to arm them so they make great decisions. Um, and um, just know that you are part of the solution. I love that you mentioned, you know, that the information should be accessible in different places. And you know, I feel like GCAT, we have expanded um, our reach in that way. You know, we're grounded in training and capacity building with organizations like schools and after school programs. But we're realizing um, that we have to evolve to, you know, using digital engagement. Mm -hmm. um, we do not only the parent toolkit on our website and our website is jam packed with information about different programs. But we also use, you know, music outlets like Spotify and, and other outlets like that to share information to have a broader reach and to reach more people. I also recognize um, that part of what you all are talking about is really our business model as an organization, right? Our formula for change says that, you know, this issue of sex education is, it needs engagement from everyone. Mm -hmm. Parents, professionals, business leaders, government leaders, the faith-based community. It's really involving the full youth support ecosystem of that community to, to surround young people, right? To support them in their health choices as it relates to not only sexual health, but any health, any health crises or any health needs that they have. So um, that's great. Makaya, from your perspective, um, you know, as a teen and as someone who has friends and acquaintances, in your opinion, what are some of the most important things young people need to let parents and adults know so that they can thrive. Like what, as a parent, you know, what is it that I need to know to help you or to help my daughter be productive and be successful and, and to sense and feel the support that we care? Um, like I said earlier, like just being, the more open you are with your kid, the more open your kid will be with you. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that strict parents uh, raise sneaky children because you have to learn how to hide things that you think you would get in trouble for. Um, I think when there's room for conversation and acknowledgement and you don't go straight to punishment and there's actually room for like growth and transparency, that's when you'll be able to do most of the teaching because it'll be um, accepted from both sides. You'll be taught by your child about how to be more accepting and how to navigate difficult situations and in turn your child will learn how to kind of take that advice from you because you're a little bit more knowledgeable, but I definitely think it starts with just there being room and grounds for conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've learned as a parent, uh, even as a professional in this um, area, is part of creating that open communication is being honest and mm -hmm. saying when you don't know yeah. as a parent. There's many times that my daughter might bring a topic to me and I, I might look a little stunned <laughs> because um, I don't necessarily know what's the right response or the right answer. But oftentimes, sometimes as adults, we like to portray that we still have the answer or we still know. But I had to lean into the fact of saying, you know what, Michaela, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, our young people are experiencing all types 
of things that I could never imagine as a young person uh, when I was their age. And so some of these things she and I both are, are experiencing together in real time, right? And so, you know, leaning into saying as a parent, you know, I don't have the answer, but let's go find the answer together. Let's, let's evolve and learn together. I think that's so important because then that gives, uh, I think, young people that sense of agency and engagement and belonging in the process to know that, number one, their voice matters. And number two, they have the power to go and be a part of finding the solution. Mm-hmm. That's great. So um, question for everyone, uh, based on your own experience, your own personal experience, what tips can you all provide for teens to have uncomfortable conversations about any topics with their parents, on, with any adult that they trust? What are your thoughts about that or what are your experiences? Okay. I'll start. So I have a 26-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son, two different creatures. Um, My daughter was asking me a million questions, my son, right? And so um, for for the tips for him is, you know, I I, I try to always be in his space regardless if he wants me there. And I just kind of don't say a whole lot, Mm. ask broad questions. And and so when you're, as a kid, if you want to talk to your parent about something, you know, don't be afraid of the, the, the punishment or the shame or um, that, you know, they're not going to be proud of you or they're going to be disappointed in you. Most of the time, if you're kind of honest and open, y- your parent will have done already exactly what you did, what you're going through when they were your age. They, sure. they know what you're what you encountered or what you're feeling. So just be brave. Um and just give up the courage and you know hopefully your parent will sit and listen and not judge you or not criticize you and you can share you know what you're experiencing but just know that they were 16 they were 15 they were 17 um and and what you're experiencing is probably not unique and they probably can help you so much more than what you think that they can yeah i love that you said you know not just the information and the knowledge but the courage Mm -hmm. (laughs) as a parent to have those conversations and sometimes that courage comes along with maybe pointing out mistakes that you might have made as a parent mm-hmm. and and how that experience went for you and maybe there's something that um, your kids or other young people in your life can glean from um, other thoughts about your lived experience your own personal experience in this area I, I grew up with a lot of misconceptions yeah. and, I, and I wish I had somebody that could answer those things for me um, through the school system, we make sure we do build that, that support trust mm-hmm. through um, school counselors, trained teachers. Um, GCAP is really good at, at helping teachers feel comfortable yeah. to, to know how to answer those things. One thing we employ during instruction is anonymous questions. Mm-hmm. So a student can just ask a question the next day when they come back to instruction the teacher can take some time with it and, and give a really clear, honest answer. Mm-hmm. And that, that students now got the information they needed and, and it was dealt with in, you know, in a really um, more gentle manner instead of, you know, you know, there's times where you probably don't want to raise your hand and ask some questions, right? When you, especially when you're with a group of your peers in the class. So to have something set up like that where um, you can, can do that in kind of a non- non-judgmental way so For sure and you know there's resources you know through gcap where um, not only do we provide those that training uh, for teachers but we also provide technical assistance right so that you know you can have those conversations with another professional and have a thought partner on figuring out you know how do i ans- the answer the ask excuse me how do i answer um, maybe this difficult question that came out of class or uh, remind me again you know what was the curriculum say about this particular topic uh, I tell my team all the time the train the technical assistance is just as important if not more important than the training itself because I think the technical assistance is, is what demonstrates our partnership that we want to stay connected to the organizations that we train the professionals that we train to continue to help them navigate that process as they're sharing the resources with young people so 
Dr. Redman, um, you talked earlier about um, access to health care um, at an early age and having that engagement from a physician early on. Um, I'm a parent, you know, I'm trying to figure out how do I access health care? Um, you know, how do I find the right doctor? What, what are some tips or recommendations you have about that process for parents? Right. So when you're looking for a health care provider, you want to look, listen to, uh, look for someone who's going to listen, who's going to listen to you, listen to um, your concerns, your style, you know? So you may want someone who's like really like jokey, jokey and fun. You may want someone who's very like stern and an encyclopedia and then gives you lots of knowledge. Um, so you want to find someone who has a style that you prefer, but most importantly, that listens to you and that will listen to your to your your child. Um, they don't want to just uh, uh, jump to the gun to um, uh, make a diagnosis and then kind of not explain to you what's going on and leave you in fear and have all this anxiety going on. Yeah. Um, you want them to um, you want to be able to trust them so that if you stepped out of the room and let your child um, communicate with them that you're comfortable um, with the information that's shared. Because you wanna give your kid that space. Um, when your kid is, um, if they come to a gynecologist, um, like the law says, you don't have to be in, in the room as a parent. And that's really kind of you know uncomfortable for a lot of parents, but it's really needed because sometimes your child will share things with their health professional that they won't share with you mm -hmm. in confidence. And so you want to pick someone um, that will, will will listen and and take care of your of your baby. So that's what you're gonna look for. So final question, and I'm gonna ask this um, question of, of each of you individually. And Makaya, I'd love to start with you. You know, there's lots of complexities that you're navigating as a teenager that your peers are navigating um, during your adolescent years, um, and through that process of navigating those complexities. Um, you know, what are you most hopeful for when you think about your generation, when you think about your future? Um, what are you most hopeful for as it relates to adolescent health when you think about overall health and well-being for your for your generation? Um, I hope that we will continue to destigmatize, um, I guess, the the just general consensus about health in general. So whether that be mental sexual or just physical um I feel like we're already doing a very good job of kind of calling each other in and being like it's okay to not be okay um when it comes to the mental health space and then when it comes to sexual health being there to give each other accurate information and point people in the right direction if we can't give it to them ourselves personally being able to point them to somebody that can mm -hmm. um and I hope to see that like with the next generation that comes from us that we'll continue to teach that and um, eventually that all stigmas behind health will kind of be eradicated. There's no doubt in my mind that you'll be a part of that, Micaiah. So that's, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Dan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, what, you, what are you hoping for? You always hear those complaints about kids these days and, and the, they're, they're not ready to, to do this or that, right? But the, the kids today are leaders of tomorrow and um, I'm happy and proud to see uh, students and, and young people stepping up and, and really advocating for themselves and advocating for others um, because they're, we're, we're stepping into a future that we don't know. Like when we, we think about how fast technology moves and we often adopt technologies without really thinking about all the implications and now yeah. we, we're dealing with a lot of those implications Absolutely. now. So we really don't know what you're going to have to deal with. but. Um, if you're already in that in that frame of mind and you're ready to to learn and step up and and be the voice for people then i i'm not worried about the future with our kids mm -hmm. dr redman as a parent as a physician uh, what are you hopeful for for this next generation as it relates to their health um, i'm hoping that again they're advocates for themselves you know they, that they um, are brave and that they're strong and that they say, okay, I think I'm ready, you know, to have sex and I'm going to go here. I know exactly where to go. I know exactly what to do to protect myself. I know exactly what to do to prevent a pregnancy. I know exactly how to tell my friends 
how to do this and it's okay and it's accessible. Um, they can walk into anywhere. They don't need to sign forms. They don't need to put their hoodie on so they don't, not, don't get caught by their parents. That it's a world where we are, um, we accept that our kids, whether they're 16, 17, hopefully not too much younger, are going to have sex because we kind of sort of did, right? We all got here somehow um, that and, and that it's accessible and we're okay with it. Again, the stigma is gone, the access is there, and our kids will be brave, uh, brave enough to get the correct information and get the care to protect themselves. So what I'm hopeful for um, is, is really sex education for all, for all young people in Georgia. And I think you spoke to that, right? When you talk about access, um, it's about ensuring that young people have access to education, access to accurate information. And it is taught in the classroom like any other subject um, that is required um, and to have policy in place that uh, mandates and requires comprehensive sex education in every single classroom across the state because our kids deserve it. Um, and they need the information, they want the information, um, they deserve it, and we have a responsibility um, as a state and as leaders to ensure that that is in place. And GCAP is unapologetic, and we are, uh, and we are advocating to ensure um, that that happens for our young people in Georgia. So that has been uh, the state of adolescence, healthier together. Um, thank you all so much. Um, for being a part of this movement as it relates to ensuring the overall health and well-being of young people to ensure a more powerful future for us all. This is about the next generation um, and ensuring that they thrive and that they are on the path to living a healthy lifestyle. I would like to thank Dr. Redman, Micaiah, Dan Smith. Thank you all so much for your partnership and your engagement with the Georgia Campaign for Adolescent Power and Potential. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all next year. Thanks for joining us.